Okay, so welcome back to the next part of our analysis, which is deciding where to put things. We're going to begin by thinking about placing things in relation to all the things that are already on the landscape, things that are going on. And this is where we come back to our maps that we made at the beginning. There we are. And actually you can work with these, these are perfectly fine because all the information you need is here. Now, one thing that does make this process easier is to create what are called data overlays. So uh, taking these and turning them into tracing paper versions. Um, and the, the value of that is that if you have to make a decision about something that involves two or more factors, so flippantly, naked sunbathing. So what kind of things do we need to know to be naked sunbathing? Where are the good places? Well, obviously it needs to be somewhere sunny, a sunny microclimate, but also it probably wants to be private unless you're a bit of an exhibitionist. So we could look at those two maps and compare them and make a decision, or we could take the tracing paper versions that we have and we'll lay one over the other and we can see through one to the other and then it makes it much easier to make decisions. So what I've done is to take all of these maps and turn them into tracing paper versions. So we'll look over here. I have my base map to this one here with my hard structures on it. And then I've done a, an overlay with soft structures. So this is the wooden, wooden fencing mostly and sleepers and various different things. And I've sellotaped that one on so that there might be times where I don't want to look at the soft structures, but most of the time I'm looking at one over the other. And of course we always want to have a, a scale because that will help us think about the size of things and a, an orientation arrow, which normally is to the top, uh, north is to the top. And so if we do that, then it's easier to read. And if other people read it, then it makes sense. When you start looking at maps where north is over here <laughs> or over there or down there, then it gets, starts to get really confusing because we might look at it and make assumptions and not really pay attention to where the arrow is and then think, oh, the sun must be over there, so that's the sunny place, but it might not be on the basis. So even though sometimes it's easier to say, okay, my site is rectangular, but it points over in that direction and north is there, let's put it on a rectangular page. Actually, you don't lose anything by putting it at an angle where north is up or to the side. Of course, north could be this way or that way. But um, because you've always got places that you want to write other stuff down, like your key. Uh, so each of these overlays has a, a name on it. So we have soft structures on this one. So if I put my desire lines over the top of that, uh, I've written desire lines uh, in a different place so that doesn't overlap with soft structures. Uh, we've also got zones here so I can put zones under desire lines and I can use that to help me make decisions uh, about where I might place things and so all of my all of this information is now as tracing paper overlays. Now yes that is quite a lot of work but we're here for the long haul. And uh, so for me, it's no big deal to make good maps, good overlays, because we'll be making decisions way into the future here about different things. And most of what's on these maps is not going to change. And if, I, if anything does change, then I only need to change one of these. I create one more. Now, I've created these, I've made these at A3. So my original maps were A4, you'll have noticed, because that's easy to take out, although you can get a3 clipboards, which are very useful uh, to go out and about with to do observations. And one of the benefits of that is, of course, that on this map everything is a little bit bigger. Now, even so, given the scale of this map, which is, so you'll see that's five meters there, so I think that's two and a half centimeters, five meters, so a, a three meter diameter tree is going to be so big it's just about manageable but it's quite fiddly when you start cutting out little things so my one of my preferred processes for thinking about putting things into the landscape is to cut out the things that we've decided to use 
and put them on the map using little bits of blue tack, that sticky stuff, I don't know what it's called, wherever you live. And, uh, and we can move that around, we can peel it off, move it around, put it somewhere else. But when you start getting to an IBC water tank, which is about one meter cubed, so then I'm cutting out a little square that's a meter by a meter. Now on this map, that's pretty tiny, could easily be lost. Someone opens the door, the wind blows, <laughs> blows things away. So not ideal, but for most of us with a normal UK urban garden, um, A3 is, an ex is a pretty good scale. If we to look at the front garden, so we've made a map, a base map of the front garden specifically. Here we are. And obviously that's a, a larger scale. So you can see that. Uh, so when I'm cutting out trees for this, my three meter tree in the front garden is this big. And that's much easier to work with. I can stick that on there. Um, and I'm cutting everything to scale because essentially I want to make sure that when I'm putting things on my map that they are to size so that when we take the ideas that we have and we say that looks great, let's go and put that in the garden, that it still fits. So cutting things to scale just makes it much easier to ensure that things fit. And I also like to cut out tracing paper and you've usually got odds and sods of tracing paper lying around corners of something you've cut out. So, and the benefit of that is that I can put a small shrub, for instance, under a large tree like that, and I can see one through the other. Um, what I've done here is I put the name of the variety, which is Newton Wonder. I've put the rootstock, M26, and I've also, three meter is the height, because I can tell the diameter by just putting it on the scale there. It's about three and a half meters. So I don't need to write the diameter, I just need to know what the height will be. And so, so that makes that much easier. And if we look at the top garden here, which is an even bigger scale, then you'll start to see that it's much easier to work with larger scale maps than it is small scale maps. So if you can make a nice large scale map and you could make maps obviously bigger than this. The other thing about a nice big map is that you put it on the wall, you can in interact with it if you've got little cutouts and you stick them on, then that makes life so much easier. It's easier to see, it, people can come in, move things around, you can have discussions about them and so on. So the kind of things that we primarily are thinking about when we're thinking about placement. So any of these overlays is relevant, of course, but particularly things like microclimates, where are the microclimates on your site? And which things need to go in the good microclimates, which things might want to be a bit cooler or shadier and happier. So our fungi, mushroom logs, shiitake on logs that we have, they're in a nice cool shady corner because, you know, moist place, because that's what they want. And then we have persimmons and we've got even got a pomegranate and an apricot and they're in the sunny spots. So microclimates is one. Uh, we thought about access and desire lines again. Where do the people, where do you move around your site? Where do you spend time? And, and so to put things that need the most attention where we, where we go on a regular basis. And if you've identified that there's something, there's a place on your site where you're not really going very much, but it's perhaps quite close to a building and could be a useful space, but it's not being used, then we can think about what might we put there to ensure that we go there and then we start to open up that place and it gets used some more. Uh, and related to this, of course, is also zoning. Zoning relates to access and design lines where we go on a regular basis. That also becomes a zone. So the zones around our main buildings where we spend time, that's our zone one going outwards and where we travel across the site, certainly on foot. Then there are also areas where we regularly visit, they're also zone ones. Um, and then also thinking vertically and also in time, but stacking what things can you reach. So if you've got a fruit tree and it's particularly tall and trees always fruit on the outside of the canopy, then it may be that it's really difficult to harvest that. So another benefit of 
having smaller trees on rootstocks as it means that things are more reachable. So zoning also applies vertically. So you might, be able to, you might walk underneath something, but you might need a ladder to go and reach it, like a gutter that needs cleaning, which is also, of course, out of sight if you're below it, see whether it's blocked up or not. So are we making best use of all vertical space? And also thinking about how the site will look in the future, in 5, 10, 20 years' time, when we plant a tree, that tree is going to grow. How big will it ultimately be? Will it create new microclimates? Will it throw shade? Will it um, create a rain shadow? Will it suck up the moisture from the ground and make it more difficult for other things to grow? So thinking forward into the future. And uh, yeah, so cut out your, all the things that you want to put in your design, cut them out on little bits of paper, ideally stick them onto your map. If you've got time to make tracing paper overlays and you think you're going to be where you live for a while, there'll be a worthwhile investment of time to do that. And it's just fun. I love this. If you've got maps, of course, that are uh, digital, that perhaps you've scanned them in or you've even made them on a computer, you can create layers by just making transparencies, putting one on top of the other. If you know how to do that, you can do it. Um, and yes, so next week, what we'll do is we'll, having put things onto our map where we think that they would sit in relation to these things, then we'll start thinking about how do we put the things we've got together to connect the system so that the output of one system, maybe compost and so on, and how does that relate to the next system which might use it. Okay, well enjoy, I'll see you next week.